time to stand and deliver the music. It's DJ Sonic. Mm. Susanna, where are you? I know you're in here. This is always so problematic and I'm not quite sure why. Um, hmm. Susanna should be sending us a request to join. And um, we did this a moment ago. We just did a sound check of this thing. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Susanna, I know you're. I know you're here. Sorry, bear with me. No, no, it's not coming up. Instagram. I know it's probably me, but no, I don't want to be in comments. I need to go live with. Here, here we are. Gonna do it. <gasps> ah, there Did you are. <laughs> Oh my god. Oh my okay, hold on. <laughs> it's such a relief. I know. I'm trying to figure out where I can sit. That's good. Is it Oh my weird god, if I, I hold? you are? I've been trying to figure out where I could sit for the last 24 hours. Okay, let me let me see if I can bring something over for my phone. I'm so sorry. I'm very bad at the oh, Here we are getting media. a glimpse getting a glimpse at Shay Hoffs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks so let's much. Let's Thanks so it. much for coming in. Oh my God, thank you. How are you? Well, I'm okay. I mean, it's, it's, this is a new thing for me. It's like we were talking earlier about teaching old dogs new tricks, you know? I know. And um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, like, like when we were just, we did that sound check earlier. Yeah. And my manager's texting me and people that I work with text me saying, you're live, you're live. I'm like, I know, <laughs> we're sound checking. I you know. know. And it's it, like when and my it, mom discovered YouTube and we were out just like, I went on the YouTube and I found the YouTube. video of you. And once I'd watched it, all these other ones came up. And I was oh like, God, and that was it. She was, down, she was down the rabbit hole. Yeah, exactly. How are so, you? So, so yeah, yeah, I'm good. I don't know, you know, we, the, so the focus of this, um, so the focus of this thing is like me, a, a bass playing thing. I mean, at least we use that for the stepping off point okay. and, uh, and, you know, music. And I know that you're a, such a deep, deep thinker musically. I mean, we reconnected at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this time last year, right? Exactly. And, and you walked out and you, you gave the zombies there, you know, you, you gave them that incredible tribute, I thought. Thank I was you. just like, I was like, wow, really, really knocked out. I mean, well, can we just go back? I'd really, I'm, I'd like to talk about starting out and connecting and how, <laughs> you, how, you, how it became a passion for you. Yeah, well, I think, um, honestly, uh, again, back to my mom, from her memory, it was like from the cradle, lit literally. I would, she was always playing music. It was the 1960s, you know, and um, so I just would sort of sing along, cool along, uh -huh. I guess you yeah, could say. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. She said that, that they, she had a little cradle with wheels on it, and it was on a wooden floor, and she'd find that I'd sort of rocked and rolled and cooed all the way to the other side of the room and she'd roll it back. So it, it just, I don't know, it's like, I, I think, and I think this is probably true for you too, that, and for some people and many people, music shoots straight past everything else. It has this way of kind of just knifing in, in a way, and changing you if you respond to it. If you're a person who responds to it, for me, it's like, uh, I don't want to make the drug analogy, but here I'll go. I'll, I'll, I'll make it. it. It is kind of like the the like a drug. It, yeah. I could be in a certain mood. I could be fearful. I could be anxious. I could be um, gloomy, and I can actually pull myself out of these moods by just listening to a song. Yeah, totally. And I, and I think actually everybody that's that's what that's tuning into this chat now. I think they all get it because I think they're all music lovers and music people. Yeah. I mean, you and I, I know it's not uh, really the right thing to talk about a lady's age, but we're kind of the same. We, we are of the same generation, you and I. John, I'm, a, I'm, I'm totally honest with you. I'm a 61 year old. Woo, woman. Bring it Woo. on. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not yeah, I'm coming. You know, yeah, I'm right. All, I'm right there with you, kid. It's all okay. Yeah, right? but 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 it, but you know you mentioned your mother, and I mean like 
you know, I, my mother was from Liverpool. So when I was two years old and the Beatles came along, I mean, my mom was just a freak for it. I mean, she my loved the Beatles. So, I mean, I got, I got them through her lens, if you, if you know what I mean. So, so they were not, they were not going to go unnoticed in my house, even though I was a toddler. You know, she would, this music would come on, she would sing along. And it was, so it was a thing, you know. Did you go to church? It, it really was. It, did it you go to church? Oh, did I? Yeah. No. Well, I, my my grand my mother's father was a rabbi, a really oh, brilliant right. rabbi, oh. and and a and a civil rights activist, and marched with Martin Luther King. Really incredible human being, Rabbi Ralph Simon of Chicago. But I had, in our household, so we I was not raised uh, with much religion, given that, but music was kind of. A religion in in the house you know yeah, it was sort yeah, of, yeah. it was sort of uh in the way that your mom loved the beatles my mom loved the beatles and actually one of her best friends worked at Capitol records oh so my that, so we have all the original beatles albums because her, my mother would say bring me a copy yeah. so we had all the original and and it was a bonding thing um for my brothers and I, because yeah. you know, the, I had I have an older brother named John, so he kind of took on the persona of John Lennon, and I don't know who I was in the band. I kind of maybe fashioned myself after Paul a bit, but I have a younger brother Jesse who was who was more like Ringo, <laughs> and so we just pretended we were a band. And and when so when when did you think I could pick? When did you think about picking up an instrument, and what was that instrument? Well, because I was singing and cooing from birth, <laughs> essentially, um, it became evident that I should perhaps have something to, to accompany me. Mm. So luckily, my mother's younger brother was also a music fanatic and ended up being a guitar builder, ended up playing with Linda Ronstadt. He put the first guitar into my arms. So I have pictures of myself like 1967. I was just eight playing guitar. Like I was playing oh, guitar wow, mostly to accompany myself, as I said. So I had something to sing to, so it was an acapella. And it um, went there. Is there such a thing as a, as a home movie from that period? Because I would, um, buy, I would pay good money to see that. I know, I have a photo, <laughs> I'll send it to you. But I don't have a home movie, I don't think. For whatever reason, my parents weren't documenting everything with, camp, with a movie no, no. back then. We mine were neither. kind of being. <laughs> yeah, 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 me too. I mean, my, you know, they weren't really, mine were not, tech savvy at all you know um Mine so that... still aren't <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's quite it's quite a thing though isn't it i mean i think like for my parents just learning how to use a box brownie camera that was a big technological leap you know yeah. or like a doorbell <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so we don't um, but if i ever come across a home movie i'll i'll that would be interesting it's funny to look back at our age and um, see the artifacts and the evidence of our youth. Um, it's it's all very black and white still. Yeah, and I find as well that you know I'm I can be quite judgmental of the person that I am sitting here, but when I look back at myself, I I, f I have nothing but love and I compassion, know. you know. I know. And support, you know. I know. It's interesting, but um, yeah, music seems to be the through line. And yeah, definitely. definitely. For both of us. So, so, okay. So what about just, um, you know, seeing as I'm a bass player and this is, uh, you know, what, did you ever feel, you, you know, do you remember, do you remember thinking that's a good bass line or do you remember being aware of the bass guitar and the role that it played in, oh my in, gosh. in the music that you liked? Well, first of all, being uh, Paul, <laughs> Paul yeah. McCartney, back to Paul, and playing this way, right? Yes, left-handed, yeah. So... I mean, those, to me, the Paul bass lines were probably the first bass lines that stood out to me. And they're so melodic, you know, and they do so much in the song, don't you think? I absolutely, mean, absolutely. Um, he always made really interesting like, choices. He always made choices that enhanced the harmonic climate, if you like, exactly. of what was going on. And being, being um, yeah, and were really melodic. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. just rhythmic. No, he was, it was like he was playing counterpoint to himself a lot of the yeah. time, you know, just to, yeah. just to bring in, yeah, very rich palette and of, the, of do, sound. Do, 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 a lot of those, like, cool, uh, yeah, now I'm spacing on which song, but, you know, like, he'd go up high and do, like, yeah. a little rhythm thing. Yeah, yeah, and, and at first like, it was just that, 
that Hofner bass, which, you know, when I, when I actually came to hold a Hofner bass like that, you know, it's like as, a, as a grown up, it was so tiny. It's so cute and yeah, lovely. Yeah, and light, you know, super lightweight. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I like guitar player. I, I kind of liked, um, I wasn't a front man. I knew I didn't see myself in that role, but I loved the side guys. I loved the guys that would come into the singer, you know, like Ronnie Wood, uh, you yeah. know, or Mick Ronson with Bowie. Yeah. You know, I, I, I really liked those guys. It felt like they didn't have, I don't know whether it was because they were holding the guitar, but they didn't have the pressure of the center, the center stage. Yeah. You know, it seemed like a little bit less pressure to be a side man. Yes, um, but I definitely didn't think I didn't think it was going to be bass, you know, really? but well, when uh, when I, I, I was sort of drawn, I, I was 16, really, before I seriously picked up a guitar yeah. and thought, oh, I've got to I've got to figure this out. But everybody was playing guitar at the time. And, and I kind of went gravitated towards bass because nobody was really interested in playing the bass. And if they were, it was like you just gave the bass to the dumb, the, the dumb kid who didn't have anything else to do and he'd just go do, 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 and follow, <laughs> follow, the, uh, follow the guitar chords, you know, but, but like I wanted to do something a little bit more different. Um, and you did. Yeah, well, you know, I was just following, <laughs> I was just following in the line of, uh, but, you know, but, but realizing how important, I mean, I love dance music. Were you ever into, you know? Well, were, don't forget because of my age and our age that like disco yeah, happened yeah. in the 70s. Yeah. For me, right when I was graduating high school, so uh, around the end of high school, I graduated in 76. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was a dancer, too. That was my other passion. I studied ballet really seriously, and I was, and then I did jazz, and then I went off to UC Berkeley, and I was in the dance company. I got into the company. Wow. And, um, so while I was studying dance, I was then in Berkeley, I would go and see like the Sex Pistols in San Francisco. Did you? Were you there? I saw Patti Smith. I saw their last show at Winter. Wow. Fall. Wow. And I went and saw Patti Smith. So I was having this sort of like, sort of mind expanding time in college, which is kind yeah. of what you're meant to do. But yeah. I, but back to dance, dance was the other thing. I think it's really, I don't know if this is true for you, but I find with musicians that they tend to love they often love to draw, paint. For me, it was all of those things. I ended up leaving the dance department and becoming an art major. So I was painting, I was dancing, I was writing, I was doing photography, and I was wanting to start a band. It all kind of was this big soup for me. But photography, it it's up. funny you mentioned photography, because on the shelf up here, I remember you turned me on to Diane Arbus. I did. Years ago. And I, you know, I had no idea. Uh, who she was but yes you've got an incredibly well-rounded cultural you know you've got you've got all those interests going on and i and i agree i think if you get it if that's your again if that's your thing i'm not terribly big on like i call it the real world you know in the world of you know of, of concrete things i, I I'm, I'm all about creativity really that's yeah. that's what makes the world interesting to me and um you know but yes the 70s also, I mean, that's the double whammy for you and I, isn't it? That, that we that we were just learning to talk as the Beatles were singing. And then as we were really learning to think, the Sex Pistols came along. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, and Patti Smith came along, like Perfect you said. And, it, yeah, and it, I mean, that's an incredible education right there for getting disco and glam. Because actually, just to go back to disco, and I was yeah. talking about it in this tutorial that I just posted. I mean, just as I started to play bass, disco, you know, started to make an impact on me and um it's interesting i read a review recently from the new musical express uh, that danny baker wrote reviewing chic's risque album which is the album that good times was on yeah. and um and he's saying everybody in the office thinks this moment is all about johnny thunders he said but in 20 years time it's bernard edwards's bass lines they're going to be talking about and i was yeah. like wow you know because yeah. everybody else was going disco bollocks you know, it doesn't right. mean anything, but that music has stayed with us. I know. And it's, pure, and, it's proved to be really durable. And dancing is still sort of like, you know, a, a, an extension of what music does to me. You know, music yeah. can soothe you, it can console you, but it can also make you want to, you know, you know, move your hips and, and dance, you know. They're, they're saying that the comments are like, show us a dance, Susanna. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, we'll have to do another episode where we, where yeah. we do that. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I guess it also helps you. I mean, I, 
because I, I love watching choreographed dancing. And, uh, and I guess it also shows you how the music, the beats of the music, your, your moving, the, the, the movements are very much sort of programmed to the sound, the beats, the notes. So it's another way of getting inside the music, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. I know. And, and so it, it sort of works on so many levels. A song, you can dissect a song back to your question about bass lines. And it's weird because um, my kids report back to me now that without knowing it, I was giving them an education in music because we would listen to music in the car. And when you're, you live in LA, you're in the car a lot, Yeah. right? So the, the, the music that I would curate for them, and they sort of had no choice. After a while, it was like, and one of them would say, I'm the DJ on the way to school, you know, it gets to be my playlist. Yeah. But I would just, you know, sort of impose my, my yes, favorite things on them as an education. And um, I would always say like, if we were, if I was playing like Led Zeppelin ramble on or something, I was like, check out the bass line, check out that bass line is so incredible. And so they would tune their ears to it. Or if it was, you know, a Sonny and Cher song or something, I'd say like, that's an oboe playing on a pop. Yeah. Record, you know? And so I didn't realize I was doing it, but it's that thing where you could listen to a song 10 times and find some new thing. If you really listen of what was going on with an arrangement and it will blow your mind. Yeah. A lot, of people are, a lot of people are really digging what we're, you know, this conversation that we're having here digging sorry about that but um no, so, so so you know songwriting so when did you so when did that start happening for you well i started writing uh, bizarrely these sort of like kingston trio kind of folk songs <laughs> back really? in the day uh -huh. when i was like that picture of there's the picture of me when i was uh, eight with the guitar so it was uh, 1967 and i would write things like the rock island line even though that was already a famous old folk song. So yeah. I kind of wrote folk songs early on. And so, because I did, my uncle who taught me guitar, uh, my mother's younger brother was uh, very good at folk from that kind of sixties folk, mm -hmm. like the mm -hmm. Kingston trio mm -hmm. and, the, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Trini Lopez, I think was another one who did Lemon Tree, all those kind of old folk songs. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and then, it, and then in college, obviously, I, you know, I met David, well, I grew up with this guy, David Robeck, who started uh, the band Mazzy Star. I don't know if you know Mazzy Star. Uh, anyway, yeah. Yeah. he was an old, a, a childhood friend. I won't get into too much detail about that, but we started writing together. And then when I graduated and came home in the summer of 1980, I advertised myself in what was the Craigslist of its time, the recycler, and I met the Peterson sisters, who are still my bandmates right. all these many years. And we began writing in earnest uh, at that point, as the band came together at the end of 1980. Do you remember your, well, of course, the first, the first show that you played together and yes. the opening song? Wow. I okay, <laughs> we played, we all had day jobs. At that point, I worked in a ceramics factory. Actually, the uncle who taught me guitar, Carmi Simon is his name, and he gave me a job. Uh, and I sat alone in a room uh, doing like sort of sanding ceramics things, listening to the radio. I'm digressing a little bit, but the first show was at Vicky, Vicky, our guitarist our lead guitarist, worked at a movie studio in Culver City. Our first gig was playing for the other employees uh -huh. at the movie studio yeah. in a big soundstage. And I don't remember what the first song was, but I remember that I spent the whole show staring down at the neck of my guitar, making sure I was being perfect. It was like yeah. I wanted an A plus on yeah. playing. The next show we did was at a punk rock Somehow we were thrown in with a bunch of punk, punk rock bands for um, some event. It might have been for No Magazine, like a, a, a fanzine or something. And it was at that show I vividly remember that I was facing a different kind of audience. They were a punk, right. they were a punk rock audience, full stop punk rock audience. And I just thought, 
I don't need an A plus on my report card. I need to be, I don't need to be perfect. Yeah. I need to lose myself in the music 100%. If I make a mistake, can we swear? On yes. the, Please. Fuck it. If we make a mistake, fuck it, you know? And it was this, it was just in the moment of being on stage, that second performance was when I realized what really mattered, which was just really losing myself in the music. And that's another one of the magical things about music and also playing music, right? Yeah. You yeah. think, John, yeah. is that you, everything disappears. Exactly. It's that everything. moment, it's that moment, you know, when the tour manager says, cues the lights and the, and the yeah. house lights go down. Yeah. And it's like, and it, for me, that is like, oh, peace at last. Right. <laughs> you know, because for the next hour and a half, you know, I know what I have to do. And the people that I'm closest to, they know what they have to do. And the dialogue that is constantly running actually gets to take a pause. And um, it's a very the powerful inner, thing. Yeah, and I loved it. Monologue. What's that? The inner, your the monologue. In yeah. But, um, but I loved it when I was going to see other other artists you know before i had my own band and i would go to see you know whoever it was i was going to see and that moment when the lights went down it was just oh it was it was just so powerful yeah uh, yeah well we were both i think that very broadly i think the bangles and duran both you could fit into the new wave bag you know we were that second we were i don't i mean i don't know about you and certainly with your you know with, with your folk background that i'm now aware of yes. but so with the other girls i mean duran even though we didn't play punk rock we wouldn't have existed without punk rock punk rock gave us permission you know exactly. i mean really you know andy was like a hard rock guitarist and he came from a different different place but the rest of us we would have never we, we would have never turned to music none of us had had any real you know music education well what about the rest of the girls I mean, we were all pretty much self-taught and, yeah. and, you know, full disclosure, I don't know how to read music. It's, no. it's shameful, really, <laughs> but I, yeah. I just, folk tradition, it's all like a recipe. It's yeah. a recipe that gets passed down and passed down and, you know, it was like, yeah, I mean, so we're not trained, no. We yeah. were definitely felt we were in the tradition of L.A. garage bands. It makes sense, though, what you're saying, because you've always had an incredible poise at the front of that band, you know, and you're really like your Joan Baez, you know, backed by The Clash. You know, <laughs> that there's like, you know, the, 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 and that to me has always been, I, I used to love, I mean, I came to see you guys quite a few times. You did. And, uh, I mean, for, for, for a moment there, I mean, I could, I'd never really been into an all-girl band. And I, it was, you guys were so incredible. I mean, we were talking about, what, 83, maybe, something like that. I remember going to see you at Jones Beach. Or it could have been oh, a, maybe a little later than that. Yeah. yeah. And, that, uh, that was amazing. You yeah. said some really nice things. It was so intimidating knowing you got you were there. Were, were any of the other guys, or was it just you? Was it you uh, and I might, I might have dragged a, someone along. Yeah. yeah. Um, I remember there's some photos of us backstage and Amy Mann. There's some photos of us. Oh, uh, yeah, too. yes. Yes. But well, um, I don't remember. I'm sure we were opening for someone at that point. We opened almost, or maybe not. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, you yeah. were so supportive, John. I, I, because, yeah, I, I, I can tell you now I was very intimidated that you were there. But I, but then you were so down to earth and just because wow. of, just because of your band being so amazing and just you guys were like superstars and we were still kind of kind of journeying up through the the you know the the experiences of mostly well, being an opening band well hold on there let's talk in you know what about what about prince can we talk a little bit about prince yeah. and how and how he came into your guys's life and how yeah. he announced himself to you and you know yeah i mean that was okay so the story was that, so I, I often get the dates wrong. I think it was 1984. We had a song called Hero Takes a Fall out, and it was in the early days of MTV, which you will recall the MTV, the MTV Prime, that whole yeah. experience, yeah. because Duran Duran owned MTV. You were like, you had mastered the art of making videos. But anyway, so we were making our first essentially our first video with 
be, having been signed to a label. And it was this song, Hero Takes a Fall, that I wrote with Vicky. Yeah. Apparently, Prince saw the video, and that's how he discovered the bangles. And so, right, right, when I, right at that moment in time, it was kind of a kismet thing, because somebody told me Prince had seen the video, and it was the very week that I discovered Prince on the radio, it was when Dove's Cry would, had just been released. So I was rather late to the party. I had been hearing about Prince for a while, but it wasn't until I was, I heard that song on the radio that I became really aware of him. And so it was weird because he was becoming aware of the Bangles that same week. And then we were in the studio recording our second record for Columbia, and this is now like 85 or something, or maybe it came out in 86, so it would have been 85. Um, we were working with, there was a team of engineers, a husband and wife, David and Peggy Leonard. Peggy was recording Prince at that time at Sunset Stamp Sound, that studio. We were at the sister studio, Sunset Sound Factory. Yeah. And um, we got a call that Prince had a song and for the Bengals, and would I drive over to Sunset Sound and pick it up? So I drove over alone in my car, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to meet Prince. And But he was recording in that moment, so the little cassette, which I still have, uh -huh. was waiting for me. And I drove back to the to Sunset Sound factory, and I handed it over, and we all hovered around the cassette player in the olden days, and it was Manic Monday. And that was our great gift from Prince. So how did you record it? Was so, he there? You know, he made accessible to us his tracks. Oh, um, and, right. But, but being bangles and being um, of the mind that we wanted to bangle-fy it from the yeah. ground up. Yeah. Our own tracks, Debbie on bass, you know, Michael on bass, uh, Debbie on drums, sorry, Michael on bass, me and Vicky on guitars. We just, you know, recorded the track ourselves um, because that felt right instead of putting our vocals on top of the existing track that he had offered up to us if we wanted it. And, um, and I'll never forget singing it the first time, just being in that dark room and that red light fever thing where you can tell the yeah. red light's on and you're in record and just really going for it and that feeling of like uh, it fit. It's like putting your foot in the glass slipper and feeling like you're suddenly Cinderella or something like you just know when something feels right. Like when you're playing anything or singing yeah. anything, yeah. sometimes yeah. you just stretch your, your, you find yourself like um, working too hard to make it feel right. As yeah. opposed to when it just feels right. Yeah. It's like, it's in the pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about it, actually, and an absolute genius, you know, absolute might, one of the greatest power, musical powers of the, of the century. But I actually, I think that was a very important song for him. And it was very, very important. I think that he, the people's perception of him changed with, with that song that you did of his, because yeah. suddenly the world saw him as a writer, producer. It was so perfectly pitched and you guys did such an amazing job of it Thank and you. i think that's where he became i mean i don't want to say star maker but you know where people were like oh wow hold on a second you know uh, so i think you you actually it was a mutually satisfying experience yeah um, you know it also it's also really helped his persona that he'd written this song for the you know for this all girl group you know i well, I, I you know we we just had it was such a blast that he would just always pop up out of nowhere and you know co often come and jump on stage at our shows oh wow yes yeah. i mean there's a little bit of audio on on youtube of of him playing uh, he loved to play hero takes the fall too that that song that vicky and i wrote wow and um because it was just a perfect song for him to do his soloing on and, and right. I've, I've said this before but i've never i had never before and never since been in the presence of someone playing guitar where it was like channeling some some higher power from somewhere yeah. like it was yeah. it was not and the guitar was just n n a part of his body it was yeah. it was the thing you hold and tune it was like and plug in it was like a part of him and it was 
I, I just, I, it was, I don't even, I have no words actually. Yeah, to yeah. I mean, what it felt like to just stand there and see it go down in real time. It was just an amazing. I think as a, as a, you know, as a producer, I think he, I, I think he messed with all of us really. I, I mean, I remember I was reviewing the singles for Smash Hits magazine the week that When Doves Cry came out. And I mean, I took it so right. personally that there was no bass on it. I'm like, what, what is this? There's no bass. I was so intimidated by the idea that there could be a record that powerful that didn't, that, you know, because apparently there was. And he was like, mm, works better without the bass. Crank up the kick drum. Boof, don't need it. And right. um, so that was kind of a scary moment. You're and just, um, and then, of course, right. the fact that he was he was doing everything. You know, the fact that oh, then yeah. we, we entered that phase in the sort of mid 80s where suddenly everybody's programming and everybody's tapping out a little groove and it's all sounding funky. And, and there was, it was a really tricky transition, I thought, because, uh, you know, for me and, you know, the band that I was in, I mean, we really pr prided ourselves on getting tight. You know, you got, we used to call it Prince tight, you know, but where you'd get really? tight, tight, you know, and you'd want to be tight, R&B tight. And then, then the machine started to take over and it right. started, you know, I've got a Lindrum. I've still got this Lindrum. It's my, one of my favorite toys now, yeah. but, but, but like, you know, everything got, how did you, did you guys, I mean, you, you've, you've, you've worked with tech, you've never let technology take over the sound of, of your music. It's, um, we, we were sort of like, I, I mentioned before, kind of a true LA garage band. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the edges got smoothed over a bit, you know, we added some keyboards. That was a big thing. Um, but we were really of that tradition. Um, I would say so. I guess, I don't think, apart from Walk Like an Egyptian, which had a programmed drum, nice. that was quite yeah. out of the box for us. Yeah. We were completely and utterly taken aback when that song, it was just thrown out to radio as a sort of third single on a record that we thought, well, that's, we'll see what happens. And we had no idea the response that the DJs got from people phoning in and requesting the song. Yeah. But I think Walk Like an Egyptian was really the only song that I can think of that really sort of, you know, kind of went in that that vein, I guess, with the, with the programming and programming and stuff. I did just want to mention, because I don't know, what, you know, many people that are, that are watching this, but we actually, we, we did Duran and the Bangles. We, we performed together, didn't we, at we the did. forum? In like '85, I think it was, and you guys came on stage with us. I think we played "If She Knew If We Knew What yeah. She Wants," yeah. which I I love that song so much. I did, too. did Amy Mann write that? Who wrote that? No, song? um, Jules Shear wrote it. Right, and there was a connection between Amy and Jules. Right. But yeah, they had been friends, and yeah, so I think. Oh, you know what? Jules Shear is in that picture with all of us too. Ah. At in backstage Jones Beach. Okay, Annie. so so listen, Susanna. I just want to, you know, there's so many people like like. Please notice us. I, your teenage stands adore you. I'm just wondering. I'm just kind of looking at the at the comments to see whether there was anything that we could that we could pull out here. Yeah, eighties. I mean, in eighty, a lot of eighties music fan do it again. Go on, ciao, John. I um, mean, it's really. I'm streaming all bangles all afternoon here in Denver. Oh. Link if you're reading this. I mean, it's quite, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Trying to maintain a conversation. Again, new tricks, trying to maintain a conversation yeah. and watching these things go by. I, was, I, was, I heard a couple of weeks ago one thing that men, apparently, men can really focus on only one thing at a time. But actually, women are quite good at focusing on several different things at the same time. Are you finding, is that, is that the case in your household? I mean, I'm the only girl in the house. I'm, I have two sons and uh, a husband. So um, I don't know. I don't know if anyone's good at multitasking. I yeah. think it might be a, a bullshit thing. I right. Think we, we think we're good right. at I, mean, I think. I think, I don't know. Maybe it's that I've had to do it. I don't know that I like doing it. I, I tried it. And now with social media, like the fact that, Everything, the world is making us have to multitask. The way yeah, I mean, I definitely, I feel my, I feel like the ADD thing, you know, it's like whether yeah. I wanted, you know, whether I had it or not, I feel it's, and, and yet, well, what about, what about this uh, isolation mode, this quarantine mode that we find ourselves in? How's that? Is that, um, I mean, yesterday we spoke and you were working on a video. You, yeah, you, I was working on a video that I was doing for, 
I, it, it was it was for a school actually. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, I think um, because my favorite, I, I've been mostly focused on creating new content. I've been working on a novel, um, and I can say that <laughs> for a while, which love has just been a labor of love. And um, I have been recording now. I, I can't go to the studio because it's not. I don't. I don't do it all myself here. So that I've had to put on hold. But I've been making. I've been making content for people. I've been. Um, I've been. I miss playing music with other people. That's. You know. I. I. I think that. And back to the multitasking thing you brought up. I think when you're playing music and you are a hundred percent. Yeah. In it, it is a kind of meditation yeah. because you can't be kind of cooking and playing <laughs> music. You, you have to, and you can't, you can sing in the shower and you can do it a little bit, but when you're really playing with, especially playing with other people, when you're listening to them, it's so beautiful to tune everything else out. So I think, um, you know, I've had to put some things on hold, like finishing my record um, until it's safe to go to the studio and be around other people. People are asking us both, but uh, I'd like to ask, what, do you, what are you listening to? Is there anything new that you're listening to? Where do you, is it important to you to, to, hear, to listen, to be listening out to, to new music? I try to listen to new music, um, but I, 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 full disclosure, I, I tend to curate playlists on, street, on my Spotify. Oh, yeah. And... Um, I do have all different ones. And um, like for my book, I have one that's music that's mentioned in the book. Um, and and I can listen to it and it'll help me write things in the book. So it's like it informs everything. And I have, you know, I listen to everything from the music I grew up with, honestly. I still, yeah. I've never gotten over that love affair. I'm still in love with the music from the 60s and 70s. What yeah, is yeah, yeah. Well, there is something. I mean, I saw a trailer on uh, TV. On uh, there's a two-part documentary about Laurel Canyon on oh, Epics yeah. coming up at the end of the month, and it just—I just got this incredible feeling just watching it. I mean, you mentioned uh, I got you, babe, earlier. You yeah. mentioned something which we were playing at the week last weekend, and this is just incredibly warm. I don't know whether it's a naive, an innocence, perhaps. But there's, a, yes, it is kind of like an innocence. It's like that discovery of, oh, we can have folk music with oboes, like you yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. got a very Phil Spector kind of thing going on. I guess it made me think, even though Phil Spector didn't produce it, just how important Phil Spector's production oh. was at that time. Oh. You know, and, and the Beatles, of course, because they started adding in these classical instruments. And, and it was when they kind of found that they had to stop touring because it was so out of control for them. I think that they thought we can't keep this going and they went in the studio if I'm right if I'm remembering correctly that they and then they got very inventive yeah exactly well that, that was that was the big decision wasn't it for them to actually pull out of live shows yeah uh, in 67 maybe I, I think you know so. Uh, so just before revolver perhaps you know so then they never had to give a thought to well can we play it live whereas the stones yeah. who became really the great band of the 70s I think yeah. ev everything they did, they're like, if we can't play this live, it's not, yes. not going to work. You That's know. interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Mm. What, about, what about the girls? What about the band? People are asking. Oh, um, everybody's, I mean, I'm happy to report everybody's home and staying safe and yeah. doing well. So we're all doing well. And we're very lucky that, you know, we've, yeah, that we're in that position that we haven't, you know, we're sad that we can't tour and, but, you know, we, we have to do the right thing and stay home. I mean, Candlestick Park in, like, yes, somebody's telling me, uh, he's having a teenage, what's your fa favorite power stage? Oh my God, they just come so quickly. What's your favorite Depeche Mode song? Someone's asking me. How about you, Susanna? What's your favorite Depeche Mode song? I do, oh my God. Well, what's yours? <laughs> I, I, um, I, I can't, when someone asks me, like, what's your favorite color? I suddenly, yeah. it's a weird phenomenon. I go into a bit of a panic. <laughs> Gosh, I, I do remember. I do remember. I used to go to a record store in um, in Soho uh, called Rocks in Your Head. Do you remember that store? It was down down in the basement no, on, Prin on Prince Street. And uh, you know, whenever I go to New York, I go and check out this record store. And uh, 
uh, I remember being in there one time and thinking, what the hell is this? Thinking it was new music and it was the band. But more, <laughs> in, but more importantly, more importantly, he would have, on, and he would have The Cure and he'd have Depeche Mode, but he didn't have Duran Duran. And I used to say, yeah, hey man, you know, I'm in mean, Duran Duran. I just wondered, like, you know, where'd you draw the line? And he goes, Depeche Mode. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Uh, so I, I've got a note. Uh, Wendy is saying to mention thanks to the teenage fans when you thank the fans, teenage fans. We have wow. teenage fans? Do we have teenage or is this, fans? This directed at Duran Duran. And no, I think it's directed at, at I'm assuming Nothing it's directed at both of us. It's more exciting than having teenage fans. Yeah. And well, we, that the music that much of it made in, you know, 30 years ago is still yes, you do. resonating. Vegetable JPG says, yes, you do. Uh, Yay, <laughs> I feel like I'm the only 18-year-old on this uh, chain. Oh, Depeche released Violator. I must say, actually, that's a great album. That is a masterpiece, Violator. I will say that. I, you know, Susanna, I think we both, I think the last show, I can't remember if Kabu in San Diego was maybe the last, last show we played. Uh, it was the last big okay. show. We played the same day, didn't we, at Kabu? Yeah, we did. Do you like playing festivals? Um, I like it. I find it challenging in terms of just the technical side of it. Yeah. Because we don't have that worked out very well. Honestly, I find what, one thing that's tricky about playing live and why I love playing in the living room with people unplugged is I love listening to what mm. other people are doing. And often when you get on the big stages, you've got monitors jammed in your ear and you have too much of yourself. And you can't yeah. quite get the... Do you find that too, John? Well, I, I, I was the last adopter of the in-ear monitors, you know, and I, I was a real holdout. And I thought it was, no, you can't do that. It's not rock and roll. You know, we've got to have yeah. the sound. We've got to have the sound. But I think, you know, the singer was the first, you know, Simon. It was like, wow, you know, I, I don't have to fight with, you yeah. know, the, everything else. I can get a perfect tone sound and uh, and then gradually it just took over and right. um but I yeah I, it's a, a violation well you definitely have to work at it definitely have to work on it um, i've never nailed it i've never really quite got it right when it, when i compare it to just sitting next to someone and playing with them just acoustic it's just the most blissful thing for me personally because i just i i'm not fighting that noise it's, it's like i it's like you're having to constantly dial things yeah yeah well we should do that one of these days let's do um, it <laughs> when uh, we come out of our homes yeah our yeah places. i really want to thank you uh, i also want to just thank everybody that helped make this happen i want to thank gila because i completely gila. lost without she's like she's like everything she's the overall technical production assistant she's Yay, dropping me notes yeah. really she's really giving to the fund here i want to thank wendy and sharon and Katty in uh, new york they really they really help us with that well we couldn't couldn't do this without them and i really want to thank you Susanna. it's really great to catch up with you it's so great to catch up with you john yeah so and uh yeah so well we don't like that phrase stay safe in this house but i guess it is it is an important you have to it is important yeah. stay safe and I'll see you at the other end of it. Yes. Thank you. I look forward to that. Love to everyone. Bye. Mwah. <laughs>